right. Well, thank you guys for joining us on our video today. We are going to talk about the health insurance options that are out there. It is now open election time for most people looking at insurance policies through work or through um, the marketplace. So I have two fabulous ladies here that are gonna talk to us today about the health insurance options if you're under the age of 65. We'll do a different conversation with another group of individuals who talk about Medicare and Medicaid for over 65. But I would love to welcome Dana and Jody. Both of them are with Domino Effect Financial. So thank you so much ladies for coming on today and talking to us about the health insurance industry. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you guys got into the health insurance in insurance industry, we would greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and get started and I'll pass it over to Jody, my associate. And um, my background is actually elementary education through college training, but I've spent a lot of time in that area without being in the school. And I happened into insurance because no one was hiring over the age of 50 at a pay rate that I was ready to work at. And they gave me an opportunity to educate others on the importance of health coverage. And as fearful as it is to go into a commission's job only, it for whatever reason was calling to me. And so I've been doing this since 2014, but I never, if you had asked me if I was going to do this, I would have sworn I never would. So that's how I got into this industry. And Jody, I think she also has a similar experience. Um, I've actually, <clears throat> excuse me, been a massage therapist for 25 years and uh, recently shifted careers due to COVID. Um, as a massage therapist, I was of course laid off for a, a time and was looking to expand my horizons into a new career as well and so I was not really sure what direction I was going to go in but decided I was going into IT previous COVID but then um, as COVID hit the industry was inundated with uh, a very experienced software developers and so um, my resume was passed from IT to sales for an insurance company and that is interestingly enough how I got started into the insurance industry. Awesome well thank you ladies again for joining and you guys obviously have a varied background so it's always good to hear people who have experience outside of just one job category their entire career. So right now we have the open election for the ACA um, which is the Obamacare um, how old is the Obamacare uh, platform, Dana, that was created, what, back in 2014, if I remember correctly? Well, it was in the negotiation parts, but it actually hit the uh, marketplace, which is what they call the platform that sells it, back in 2015. I was not working in that arena uh, back then. I was working on the supplement side, and I thought, I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to do that, and here I am. Uh, doing that for the last two years working with the ACA marketplace. It's called the Affordable Care Act now. We only refer to it as Obamacare because so many people still have not heard of or they don't recognize it when I say ACA marketplace. So it is the Obamacare. And right now it is still the exact same platform that it has always been. The only thing is they've uh, taken away the penalty that used to exist if you weren't on the ACA marketplace. Oh, gotcha. So, um, Jody, with the number of Americans, I, I'm just pulling up on Wikipedia right now. Last year, there were 32.8 million Americans uh, that were uninsured. Um, what is available out there on the marketplace that these uninsured Americans are not taking advantage of, or why would people still be uninsured in the United States this, in the United States at this point? Um, well, I think Dana can probably speak to it better than I could, but I, one of my perspectives is, is a matter of education, um, <clears throat> getting the word out. Uh, there's a lot of people that need these resources that don't even know that they exist. And, um, and, and the number of resources is endless. It's just a matter of knowing who to talk to. Um, I know Dana's had 
quite a bit of experience uh, with a lot of different resources. Dana? Yeah, so we've got a very large spectrum on where people fall. And if we are speaking specifically ACA marketplace, Obamacare, government-sponsored insurance, there are two areas that do not get the subsidies, which is that reduced uh, premium due to your pre-tax credits. And it's directly related to your income. So if you are not making enough money, you don't have pre-tax credits to put towards your um, premiums. And so you do not qualify for subsidies, meaning the entire price is going to be lying on your shoulder. And obviously those on the lower economic, it will not be available. So we do have Medicaid in many states that becomes available. However, here in Florida, where I'm located, it, the governor did not expand Medicaid to include adults. So there are certain criteria that I won't go into here because I am not a certified Medicaid agent, but there are certain requirements you must have and to be a able-bodied adult with no children, regardless of income, you do not qualify for Medicaid. So that leaves a lot of people in the hole there. Then we have a lot of people who are not looking at the AC marketplace because they think they make too much for coverage because they think it is for the poorest uh, demographics where that is completely wrong. And so they've never looked into it. And when they run the quotes, I tell them, I said, well, have you ever looked? And they have not, we run the quotes and it's like, well, yes, you absolutely do qualify. And that could be a family with $80,000 a year income. And they thought, really, at $80,000 a year, I qualify? Yes, you did. And you actually have a nice subsidy. So they are coming on board. So there's a lot of education in that area. And then we've got the people who make too much money and they do not qualify for subsidies at all. And they are either having to pay full price because they do have pre-existing conditions that need to be covered or expensive drugs that need to be on the plan that are only covered on a comprehensive plan that the ACA marketplace is. We've got group insurance through employers that are comprehensive coverage. But when people say that law about pre-existing, I thought you couldn't have insurance that knocked out pre-existing. And I'm like, only on the ACA marketplace. We have off ACA marketplace, but they still can have those limitations where pre-existing is not covered. So there is a lot of variance on who's using the marketplace and why they're using the marketplace and who wants to be on the marketplace, but they can't be because it is out of their budget. Got it. So I know back when it first came out, it was a mandatory thing and they had what we would call emergency uh, only policies that were the bare minimum that you had to get. Um, what kind of plans are out there right now? Are they still doing the uh, emergency plans or the bronze or silver? Okay, plans? that's Is called a MEC plan. And um, those are just your basic care going into the doctor's um, emergency room. But as soon as you go to um, the um, hospital and higher level care, it's not going to be covered. It's just for the simple urgent care and doctor ins and outs for the regular accidents and illness. And those are still out there. I do have people that are using those plans. We have what's called a short-term medical, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is short-term, meaning it could last from one month to, depending on the state that you live in, how long, whether it's a three month, a six month, 12 months, up to three years. So it's a very high variance. Um, Florida right now has been approved for up to three years on the short-term medical. And it's kind of like one of those plans that you see that says uh, you are responsible for everything up to deductible. And then once your deductible is met, you have either your coinsurance or 100% coverage. And we're looking at two different words, the deductible and the max out of pocket. Deductible is the amount you must pay out of your pocket 
to have your benefits kick in, like an 80, 20, 70, 30%. And then when you reach your max out of pocket, you reach 100% coverage. When your deductible and your max out of pocket are equal, the second you reach your deductible, you receive 100% benefits. So there's a lot of information that you need to understand and a warning of, warning of caution to those who are going to these public websites where you can enroll in an insurance plan without speaking with an agent. And it is an absolutely true and it's, it, you know, it's an accurate coverage. But if you're not talking to an agent, you may not know what you're actually signing up for. And I recommend you always talk to a licensed, qualified agent who has been in the immediate services, not services from four years ago. Insurance doesn't look anything like it did four years ago. You want to talk to somebody who is current and active with that type of product when you're asking questions. I got it. So with the short-term plans, like who would usually use those short-term plans? Would those be people that would travel from out of state or outside the country to come to the United States to cover them while they're here? Okay, Florida good question. We're in Florida. Who would that and that's a question most people do not ask, is what happens when I travel. On the ACA marketplace, predominantly, if you leave the state and sometimes even smaller areas, um, county or cities, you may exit your network area. So it's important to understand where your network is and how far it goes. And can you cross your lines with that? In other words, out of network. Does it cover out of network? Those are all things that your general consumer would not know, but the agent would know. ACA generally is going to be state restrictive. The people who are traveling, they know they're traveling all the time because they've got family in certain states, they have a vacation home in certain states, they may be opting for the short-term medical or maybe a share plan, which is not insurance, but it has similar guidelines. Um, with a broader network so that when they are traveling, it will still work. I have people going outside of that. People who cannot afford what's on the ACA marketplace are going off marketplace. People who are limited to by, by the doctors available on the ACA marketplace, their doctors are not on it. So they are going outside of marketplace. So it's a matter of cost, use, access to doctors, um, flexibility, all of those things uh, come into play when we are doing that. And then there's one other that's called limited benefit plan that is not as broad spectrum coverage. It's better than nothing, but it does carry some high risk. Again, you need to be able to speak to an agent that can explain those risks because I have heard people, agents, um, offering these products as a uh, no deductible covers everything and the cost is very, very low. And those are correct comments. However, they leave off the qualifiers of covers everything to a limited amount. And yes, first dollar out, but how many dollars are you responsible for once the limit has been reached? So again, talk to an agent that is um, a broker with multiple options so that they don't feel that need to push you into a pigeonhole and represent that product um, as truth, but leaving out some important details. So let's talk about making those selections and, and having that choice of talking to a, a licensed broker. How quickly do people need to make those choices? Is it an open marketplace all year round that they can get these options? Or is it like ACA where you only have between now and December 15th to select? Okay. And then after January 1st, you're, you're locked in. The government program is very much November 1st to December 15th only. If you miss it, it's gone forever. Until next year, then you can do it. Another thing that people don't realize it doesn't start until January 1st. So all the work we're doing with applications today, they don't start until January 1st. So if they don't have a plan today, they may need a short-term medical just for two months to take them to the January 1st date when it kicks in. Now, all the other plans are pretty much available next day. Only the ACA marketplace has some waiting period. 
During the rest of the year, we have what's called a special enrollment um, period, meaning something in your life has changed, which allows you to access to a new enrollment period with um, a loss of group coverage because you no longer have the job. You've gotten married, so now you have a different circumstance. You've added a child to your family. You've gotten divorced. All of these moved to another state. These are special enrollment periods, which open your doors to the enrollment process on the ACA marketplace, but you only have 60 days to get it done. When the 60 days is over, you have to wait until open enrollment again. So if somebody's getting COBRA from a, a job loss, they only have 60 days to roll it into an ACA or they have until 60 days they, after the COBRA? They have 60 days to determine whether they're going to take the COBRA or switch over to ACA. But once their COBRA expires, now they lost coverage again. So, um, you know, there, there's that other part of the conversation and there's just a lot of details on what qualifies, what does not qualify. So I really don't like talking too much about that because it is very individual. Um, and so when I'm talking on these broad spectrums, open public, it's important to know that everything is very, very specific to the individual situation. So, so yeah, so anybody who's looking for a job change in the new year or has a suspect, uh, like a, a feeling that they're not going to have their job or they're going to have a very short time period between layoff and the time their insurance expires, they should really be talking to an agent as soon as possible to find a, a new policy or to find out the yes. best way to handle it. If they know they're going to use lose a qualified group policy, then they need to start having those conversations get the application in because there is also some time in between of the application being put in and the application being accepted. When we're talking about the ACA, when we go off marketplace, typically the plan goes into effect the very next day and it doesn't matter when they come in, it's any time during the year. So there's a lot more flexibility and options outside of marketplace, but there are also a lot of reasons why marketplace is the best. If I've got somebody with um, strong conditions pre-existing, they really belong either in a policy through an uh, in, in employer or on the marketplace because pre-existing for the most part is not a coverable, coverable event. Do I have policies that will? But yes, there are guidelines as to when those pre-existing would be covered. Perfect. So what are the major things? I, you've already started touching on this, but when somebody's looking at an insurance plan and money is obviously a concern, what would be something that you would look at first? And then what would be something that's not as important, but when you're looking at a financial security issue? Okay. Um, because I am a broker and I have access to every type of product we just spoke about, I do an initial intake on the first call, about 15 minutes. I find out what their limitations are, what their health is, what their medications are. And then I actually go and look at all the appropriate policies that are available to them. I run the quotes and then I present to them with the options and the choices. We also look up, are there doctors in the network? We look up, how much is this medicine going to cost? Because there are a lot of public platforms for reduced um, rates on pharmaceutical. And a lot of times, the best prices can be found there. So it doesn't mean uh, in today's world that prescription insurance is as strong as it used to be. That you may find better rates. And again, everything is very much on an, an individual basis uh, as to where I will put them. I have some people on a limited benefit plan, not very many. I have a ton of people on short-term medical. I have the other half of my clientele, and I would say it's about half and half, um, on the ACA marketplace. And then the majority of them have what I call, or not what I call, but what is called supplemental insurance, which is money that comes to you, that you get to spend any way you see fit, and you get it because of a specified health event that you carry this supplemental policy for, such as accidental uh, supplement, cancer policy, 
if you are diagnosed. Now you receive a lump sum cash value. And again, even these supplemental policies, they differ from carrier to carrier. And I represent more than one carrier on supplemental. So I can still do a comparison. So we've got lump sum and then we have limited uh, indemnity plans on supplemental. And that just meant, means, did you get one lump sum regardless of how much it cost? Or did you have the type of insurance where it said you had a service for X, Y, Z, and X had the value of 20, Y had the value of 30, and, and I'm making up numbers here. And each one has a value amount set to it, and you receive that specified amount regardless of the charges where lump sum says, oh, you had a $30,000 bill and you were covered up to 1,700. Here's your 1,700. So it all varies because not all um, events put you in the hospital, but you can still collect cash. And that's what the supplement is about. And that is by far the least expensive and an accident plan is the most beneficial, least expensive plan because everyone is susceptible to accidents and they can range from small to large. Gotcha. So I know that there's a possibility of other things in life, life situations that happen. Um, one of the other things that I've noticed when I've talked to other insurance people is, is especially people in my age group, is pregnancy family planning, things like that. And a lot of people don't know what opportunities are out there in the marketplace to, to properly family plan in addition to making sure you're not paying a boatload of money to be in a hospital and have a baby. Are there any particular programs out there right now that people need to be aware, about, aware of when they're trying to do family planning? Yes. This time period? One of the questions I asked during my intake is, is anyone currently pre uh, pregnant or planning to be pregnant in the next year? The reason being, most off-marketplace programs will not cover pregnancy, not all, but most. And the ACA marketplace is the only one that would automatically cover that. Now, a lot of women do not realize that they could possibly qualify with Medicaid through their state as a pregnant mother. So we do advise them to find out. Don't guess that you qualify or not because we are not in that position to make that determination. Fill out the application. If you get it, fantastic. You know that you're gonna be well taken care of. Your babies are gonna have amazing doctors because I've seen what's available in the Florida area, at least in our area here, Tampa Bay community. Uh, the doctors are awesome. Um, and they'll have great coverage. The mom will be covered during that time. So we always look at that as an option if a mother finds out she's, oh my goodness, I'm pregnant and my coverage doesn't have that. And if they can't get into open enrollment for the January date, they have to find other ways. Um, another thing that is not insurance related uh, but is called Healthy Start, which is a pro public program, government-sponsored program, has nothing to do with income. Absolutely nothing to do with income and everything to do with a healthy outcome of a pregnancy to a full delivery healthy baby. And they offer resources from just help of, oh my gosh, I'm not qualifying for Medicaid. What do I do? Who do I contact? Or how do I fill out a Medicaid application? Or where can I get resources? How can, I, this is my first baby. They are able to be a resource for that mother. And every single OB, when a mother is uh, diagnosed, I don't know, do you call it diagnosed? I guess um, we consider it diagnosed. Or... Said, you are pregnant. Um, the, right in the very first forms, the Healthy Start form is there. But I can tell you from experience, the majority of mothers blow right past that form because they think it is based on economics and they assume that they would not qualify. And that is far from the truth. Well, that's good to know. I know when I worked at another healthcare system here, that was a, a question all the time was, 
I make too much, I think. And I'm like, no, feel free to call them. They're a resource. It's not affiliated politically. It's not anything right. connected. They're, they're there to make sure we have healthy children and we have a, a good birth rate and healthy mothers that don't die during childbirth. We want to have healthy people in our community. So that's awesome to know and that there are opportunities out there, whether you family plan or if you happen to have a, a wonderful surprise or a not so wonderful surprise, depending on your situation. Um, are there any things that you would suggest, because you guys also do um, other policies as well, when you're in your like 30s, 40s, 50s, are there certain policies that you would suggest people start to investigate or look at? as they age absolutely medicare medicaid and um th this is jody's passion she really really appreciates the urgency for particularly families to um get their plan in place in advance and for me personally in regards to this don't wait don't assume that you will always have good health with any insurance, even car insurance, it doesn't cover you after the event. You have to have it in place before the event. Our personal story within my family, we do have somebody that became ineligible for a life insurance policy at the ripe old age of 16. It can happen to anyone out of the blue don't be caught off guard and I will pass it over to Jody because this is where her passion lies. So, so Jody, tell us those lovely uh, oopsie daisy situations that happen in life that we never plan for. What should we be, be really planning for? Well, I think one that's most prominent on my mind right now is COVID. How many of us have lost our job, been out of work, furloughed, you know, all of those scenarios where we don't have income coming in and now we're relying on either unemployment or um, a loan or sometimes there are no resources. And I think that's one that's really spoke to me more recently. Um, but there's scenarios, you know, like, college or buying a house and having a down payment or um, all of a sudden you're in an accident and you can't go to work or you got diagnosed with cancer and you know life changes a lot with all these experiences so there's a, a policy it's called an indexed universal life it's a whole life policy that's very niche market um, but the amazing thing is, is that it's protected. Um, one of the things that a lot of people do is rely on their 401ks to get them through. Well, what happens when the market crashes, right? And all of a sudden you have zero for all those years that you worked so hard. This policy is protected. It doesn't, it doesn't lose, you know, past what you put into the policy. Um, it can work the S&P market and help it grow. And the beauty of it all is that it's tax free. So when you put your money in, it's tax free. You know, you're using uh, money that is not going to be taxed, right? That's already been taxed, I should say. But also as the money grows, it's tax free. When, you're, when you use this as a death benefit and it goes on to the rest of your family, it's tax free. So there's a tax never, believe it or not, there's a tax never out there. And that's what this policy, and it's a beautiful thing because, you know, as this policy grows, oh my gosh, you know, our car broke down and now we don't have another $15,000. I mean, I know that's cheap, but you know, it's an emergency. Are we going to go spend another $50,000 for a car? Are we going to try to figure things out? It's up to you. But it depends on your policy. It depends on what's available. There's a lot of variables into that. But I definitely see this as a, something that you should do as soon as you are educated on it. Just because the younger you are, the more it can grow. Now, unfortunately, I did not come into the knowledge of this beautiful policy until now. 
and I am approaching 50 at the end of the month. And so my, my limitations for growth to when I want to retire uh, is not as good as someone that can be 20 or 25 and starting a family. And so um, there's definitely, I mean, I could go on and, you know, you can switch it to where another beauty of this policy is, is that, okay, you say, you say, you say, that's not just a death benefit. You can use this while you're living, right? Let's say, oh, I'm going to start using my money when I'm 70 for retirement. Okay, it's switched. You're no longer making payments. It's paying you. And you can outlive the policy. I know that's a big concern for a lot of people. It's like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to outlive my policy. But um, there's a lot of amazing benefits to this policy that could really help you in a predicament like COVID or all these other scenarios that were mentioned. But this thing is just a beautiful thing and it grows really well and you can leave a nice little benefit to your family. That's awesome. Um, yeah, those are one of the things that I know that a lot of us, we don't take advantage of anymore. I know that like people think Gerber policy and just go and they don't realize what these policies can really do. Mm -hmm. So speaking of getting older, there's also things like a long-term care insurance policy. Um, I know that for my family situation, which, which some people are aware of, um, I wish my parents would have taken advantage of it when I talked to them three years prior to my father's stroke, um, because when I found out what it did back then, um, it, it would have been a lifelong policy for him if we had registered for them back in 2009, 2010, buying a policy, because that would have been for the lifetime of, the, of his life uh, to help with long-term care. So is there still long-term care out there, one? And what other policies are out there that people should be aware of and possibly consider, you know, can, with everything that's out there? We've already talked about a cancer uh, program, an accidental death or uh, accidental policy in general if you can't work. So what other policies are out there? Okay. A um, little bit of education when individuals are looking for life coverage or the big, oh my gosh, what if this happens type of coverage. There are certain things they need to understand. There are specified disease, and then there is critical illness, and there is chronic illness. Each one of them have very unique and limited triggers for the payout of money. Specified disease, is exactly that. If I have a policy that is supposed to send me large money because I got cancer, heart, stroke, that's specified disease. But what if I got COVID? Cancer, heart, stroke, no, it's none of those. Yet I'm in the hospital, I've lost my job, I've got these bills, but it will not kick in. So specified disease, it must be one of the specified diseases. And typically there's seven different specified diseases. If they would like that information, I can go over that information uh, with them. But that, that's one area. Critical illness, that is your cancer, your heart, um, the, the stroke. There are some others that fall under the category of critical. And again, that's what triggers the pain. The one that is magical that not all policies offer. So you need to ask this question, does it cover chronic illness? Chronic means long-term. Without cause, what's the disease? What was the reason? Was it a broken leg that stuck you in a wheelchair for six months? Can that happen? Absolutely. That is chronic. And chronic is designed by activity of daily living. And I always forget one of them, but basically it's what do you do when you get up in the morning? You get out of bed, so are you ambulatory? You go to the bathroom, hygiene, brush your hair, take a bath, those type of things, and you grab something to eat. And I know that there's something else. What am I leaving out, Jody? I, I always leave out one thing. 
Uh, I think it's getting, did you say getting dressed? Uh, yeah, did I say that we got dressed yet? Maybe not, I may not have said getting dressed. So, well, there it is. I don't get dressed before I go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> little levity here for the conversation um and yes being able to dress yourself and, and so if two just two of those activities regardless to why that can trigger the large lump sum payout that we were hoping for when we got that policy but a lot of people don't have that on their policy they just assume they do because they didn't know to ask that question and along that line with that chronic illness again depending on the policy that you have and i do work with a policy that does offer this you can set it up as if it were long-term care and you're going to be getting a monthly paycheck long-term care as an insurance did you know you have to do it before a certain age once you've passed that age you're no longer eligible so, so what's, what's that is? yeah long-term care you have to put in place when you're relatively i'm 40 years old why do i need to be thinking about that now well you need to be thinking about that now that is when most people start coming on to long-term care um it's been a while since i have done long-term care and i can't remember the exact age uh, of cutoff but it's much younger than you would anticipate so do I do that? Yes, I do. It just has not been, you know, on, on my front table of, of the policies that I offer. So long-term care is out there. It is extremely important to have if you're able to. It's also one of the more expensive ones. But if you have a life insurance policy that includes that type of monthly payment, there's a lot less effort in even collecting that money there can be delays on the long-term care in collecting the money even when you um, reach that point of, oh my goodness, I need to use this. Uh, then we have what's called long-term disability. A lot of people uh, confuse the two. Long-term care is because you have ended up in some sort of healthcare facility or um, homebound and needing care on a regular basis. That's long-term care. Long-term disability, that's paycheck protection. That's insurance on your paycheck. So that if you cannot go to work for long periods of time, you can purchase long-term disability for X number of months or years, covered at X number of dollars, but you cannot go above what your actual income is. You can only cover your actual income. You can't dream big and say, well, one of these days I'm going to be making a million dollars a year, so I want to cover that. You can't. There's laws that keep you within your actual reality. And then we have short-term disability, which is more common. And those are typically found through group insurance uh, when you are doing uh, open enrollment within your group, the employer. And those come in typically as a supplemental policy. So when you're doing the supplement conversation about accident, um, hospital coverage, cancer coverage, short-term disability is usually on the table as well. If it's available to you and your budget allows it, I strongly advise people sign up for the short-term disability because you never know what's going to happen. And the less income you have, uh, the more impact it will have on your family if you're not working for two months you're going to feel that it's possible to lose your home. So with that ability to carry at a low monthly rate, as long as it's within your budget, that is something that people should be considering. Um, and then we, as Jody was talking about, the life insurance that is whole life, permanent, it lasts until you pass away. It has benefits in the immediate need, it has living benefits. That's, I got sick with something major, but I didn't die. And yet my family still has to financially go through this. And I just wanna share a real quick story. Uh, one of my other uh, mentors that I work with on life insurance, she became a life insurance agent because her siblings went bankrupt taking care of their father. 
The mother passed away quickly overnight, instantly with a heart attack. There were medical bills and there were bills because she was no longer part of the family, but it was something they could manage. Soon after, a couple of years after, their father became, di or became diagnosed with cancer and he lived long enough to where there was care, there was hospitalizations, it was long, there were medical needs, and he did not have any type of life insurance to help with this. So as a family, the siblings were making sure he had a nice place to be. And I know you can appreciate this, uh, Rebecca. Absolutely, I can appreciate and that. Their children lost their college money that the siblings had been saving because this was their dad, the dad they loved. They wanted to make sure he was in a safe environment during the worst time of his life. They wanted to be there for him. Because of that, she understood the value of life insurance. It's not all about, well, what if I die? It's the what if you live. You've got bills that need to be paid. And I hear Jody's. Yeah. I was just going to circle back to okay to the question that you asked Rebecca about of uh, uh, what age is the cutoff. There really isn't a hard line number, and uh, people from sixty to almost seventy, one fourth are denied the policy. And it all depends on your health, and it all depends on the circumstances, right? But it jumps to half are denied by seventy. So with those numbers in mind, the sooner you uh, think about a policy that can cover this, and I'm sure the older you are, you know, it's, the older you go, the, the more health issues are going to pop up, the less coverage it's going to be, the more expensive it's going to be. That's what most policies. So it's just all about planning ahead if you can. Yeah, and, and going back to the story of using life insurance as an option, short-term disability, like I know people who actually use short-term disability during their pregnancy because FMLA, FMLA will only pay for so much. Uh, government requires so much on protection. But then if you have that short-term, at least you're getting, you know, two-thirds of your paycheck mm -hmm. um, to at least cover some of those, you know, financial responsibilities while you're not working. And you can then pay your medical bills when they come, they come in the mail. Um, so it's like th those types of things. But it's, it's having those conversations as soon as you can about, you know, because you could really financially go broke. And thank God my parents financially planned amazingly um when i was growing up no we didn't have everything we wanted on a silver platter my parents you know we we lived at kmart if we got new shoes it was waiting waiting till our toes were poking out blue light special yeah the, uh, the, the blue light special was our our cup of tea so it's it's making those decisions and now that I see myself possibly not having children. I'm 37 years old, I'm not married, but there's a possibility that I may not have children. Like my parents have myself and two siblings to rely on to help out. But for me or for, or for other people that have made the decision not to have children, what happens when you get to that age where you need that care? You know, those are the types of things that people don't talk about until they're in their 60s, 70s, and it may be too late and it may be too expensive. Right. Um, even for me, like, I don't have a regular income until you help care gets up and running, so please invest. Um, <laughs> just dropping that out there, people. Um, but with, with having, you know, financial ability to do certain things, do it when you're younger, especially if you don't have and don't ever rely on children ever. My parents have learned that the hard way with us sometimes. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're there for our, our parents. But I know that for financial wise, I cannot afford to take care of my dad's medical bills. Thank God he, he has what he has. He has a great pension. He has a, a health insurance policy that is through his pension. And, you know, I'm so how thankful that he has that. But there are many people in this country that do not. Uh, there will be many more people in this country that do not, that we will possibly not have Medicare uh, in the future. Um, we don't know. The next 20 years for my generation um, is going to be coming up to the 55 years of age, starting retirement. Who knows what's going to be available? 
So if you were to give your last thoughts and we're, we're, we can wrap up our, our conversation, what would be one thing that you would give as a golden nugget advice as a, a, a going away? Uh, yeah. Move? This is something I have been telling people all the time. Have an agent that you know the phone number, you know the name, and you can pick up and talk to because knowing the product is half the battle of getting your claims paid as opposed to having an 800 number to call. And it's just like when you go to a restaurant, your favorite restaurant, do you get a different table every time if you go into that restaurant on a regular basis? No, you go to the table that always has the same server because guess what, the server knows you, your drinks are already on the table because they saw you coming through the parking lot and they're asking, out of courtesy, because you might have changed your mind, are we doing the same thing today or are we doing something different? And they've already told the back kitchen, oh, customers, happy people, they're here and guess what? Your meal's coming out faster because you know the server. It's exactly the same thing when it comes to an insurance agent. Know them, talk to them. And you want to get that agent will call, that will call you or at least send out a hello on a quarterly basis because guess what? Life changes. And if your agent doesn't know you had a life change mm -hmm. that qualified you perhaps for benefits or a, oh my goodness, let's take a look. Let's do this, such as having a baby. There's a lot that is, re is time related on insurance. And so having a relationship with your insurance agent, whether it's property and casualty, which is your car, your house, boats, those type of things, your health insurance agent, or your life insurance agent, know them and expect them to know you because that's where you get service. Because let me tell you, I have had people denied on a claim. I don't know anything about it. I don't get these reports. But because I call my people at, on a quarterly basis, they said, yeah, you know, we went and for some reason they didn't pay, pay that claim. And I'm like, well, why didn't you call and tell me? I am allowed to come in as a liaison with the client on the phone and say, here's the situation. Can you please explain? And they'll say, oh, well, it's because of this not being part of it. Oh, okay. We take care of it and the claim is paid. So far, I'm batting 100%. So we will see. I mean, it's, I can't always guarantee that type of uh, response, but it's about knowing the language, about knowing where to cross the T's and dot the I's to make sure we're meeting the requirements so that a claim is actually paid. Perfect. And what about you, Jody? What final nuggets would you give away? Um, I think one big thing that I, I did is my, myself, and I didn't ask, the broker, I didn't ask the insurance person is how much does it really cost to get started? It, we get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, well, I need, I need a million dollar retirement or I need a whatever. Have a hundred thousand dollar policy that you can afford. Start where you can start. Do you even know what your health and your, your finances can get you? Ask those questions so that you can get something, something started. The younger you start it, you might match the same person that starts when they're 50. You know, you, you might be that at that point of the game, you might surpass them. It depends on the policy and it depends on your age. But one thing is, is on those policies and on that age, you can really get to a point in your life where you started this policy when you were younger. And now you're more financially stable. If you can throw more money at it, then do it or start another policy. But the younger you are, the better the rate. So if you can just grow the policy that you have. But just don't, just don't hide, don't be the ostrich that hides your head in the sand. Go out there, get somebody that can help you. Just learn what you can afford. And if all you can afford is a hundred dollars or fifty dollars a month then do it just start somewhere you'll be really glad you did because not only are you protecting your life but you're also protecting your finances as well 
Exactly. So it, it takes money to protect your money, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yes, very good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much, Dana, Jody. It's been wonderful. Uh, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they have any additional questions on insurance or other policy questions out there? The most direct method is a text to my personal number. And that's 321-247-8777. Three, two, one, two, four, seven, eight, seven, seven, three. And you'll notice I said text. I'm on the phone a lot and phone tag is never fun. A text I can call as soon as I see it come in and I'm free. Perfect. And what about you, Jody? What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? I think I'm going to have to ditto Dana um, because, you know, the life of the insurance is um, predictable. And, um, so a text, um, and if you don't hear back from me within 24 hours, leave a message. But for the most part, the phone call is the easiest. Um, you can reach me at 980-785-4380. Again, that number is 980-785-4380. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again so much. You have given us a lot thank of you. information. Um, and so hopefully we'll have you back on if there's anything that comes up during COVID, post-COVID, you know, I know that there's probably going to be changes in insurance. Um, yeah. They start talking about, you know, people who've had COVID. Um, so we'll definitely bring you guys back on again. Thank you again so much. Thank Thanks you, for Rebecca. making time for us, Rebecca. You're welcome.